morning. Good morning. I am so glad we changed rooms. Yeah. Um, and uh, Jenny, thank you very much. Um, it was Jenny Sayre who kind of pushed me to getting that done. Um, it's wonderful to see you all here. Um, I've, we've been chatting among ourselves, uh, the panelists and I, and, and I, I think we feel that you're in for a really good time. And I think we feel that, you, that we are too. Um, I will say this again later, but um, I am expecting that not only will you have questions that you will want to pose, maybe to the rest of us, but certainly to Fred, uh, but I think we're also expecting, I know that I am expecting, that we will hear testimony from you. So you can think of this as a meeting. Um, and, and I think I can feel the emotion in the air already. If you haven't figured it out and you don't know me, I'm Ken Yellis, and I'm the instigator of this. And uh, I, I should say in the first place, that the title that's printed in the program is not the actual title of the panel. Um, the actual title of the panel, which I stole from Nathan Englander, who I'll be talking about again in a minute, was what we talk about when we talk about race, uh, which is a little bit different from the, the other title. And I just thought that that nuance was worth getting in there. Um, in the last a uh, year and a half or so, I've been working on an exhibition called Passages Through the Fire, Jews in the Civil War, which opened at the Center for Jewish History in Manhattan last month. When I tell people about it, I get typically two responses. The first, which is my sister's response, but I've heard it from others, there were Jews in the Civil War? Who, who knew? <laughs> The second is more interesting. These Jews who were in the Civil War, the response goes, they were against slavery, right? And the answer to that is, not so much. In fact, hardly at all. With some exceptions, the people whose historical narrative pivoted on an epic escape from slavery were either complicit in the American chattel slavery system, or silent on it. Dale Rosengarten quotes a Sephardic proverb which goes, the law of the land is the law of the Jews. In the post-Holocaust era, she goes on, you think, of course they would be the champions of the oppressed and the downtrodden. But in the era of slavery, it just was not so. And I would add, this, by the way, is not just in the South, this was everywhere. The abolitionist senator, Ben Wade, calls the senator from Louisiana, the Jewish senator, I, I hate to say it that way, from Louisiana, Judah P. Benjamin, an Israelite with Egyptian principles. Uh, Benjamin was not unusual in, in uh, his ardent pro-slavery views, but he was an unusually outspoken Egyptian. The majority of American Jews in this period especially rabbis, were mute on the subject. The dam of silence was not breached until January of 1861, when the war was at hand. For me, the silence is more problematic than the complicity. Arnie in Camp Sundown and Nathan Englander's What We Talk About When We Talk About Anne Frank says, to murder is to murder. To stand by for a murder is to murder. To hide the history of murder is to murder. The turning away of the head is the same as turning the knife. To watch and say nothing it is as bad as the killing. Guilty is the watcher, Agnes says. Guilty all. So if we're all guilty of silence, and I think we are all guilty of silence on something, what then must we do? I like to say that there are only three important reasons to do exhibitions. You have a new story to tell. 
you have a new way to tell an old story, or the story has been forgotten or hopelessly corrupted. But maybe we are returning to mining the museum after 20 years for a fourth reason, to think about what we are doing when we make an exhibition in this troubled world, to paraphrase another Fred Wilson exhibition, so much trouble in the world. By the mid aught aughts it was possible to ask whether museums were really ready to respond to this challenge. But I also thought I detected a growing discomfort about, his, about this hesitancy. My article, Fred Wilson, PTSD and Me, Reflections on the you've, you've seen that, right? No. It's not like you're in the title or anything. Um, Fred Wilson, PTSD and Me, Reflections on the History Wars, which appeared in Curator in 2009, received a lot of feedback. It was really amazing. It's as close as I will ever get in my dwindling years to going viral. Um, on one level, it seemed as if museum professionals felt that mining the museum had more impact on how they think about their own work than on how they are allowed to practice it. But others were more hopeful. There's one, and I'll read it at length. Wilson's approach has directly changed the way I've worked as a curator and the way the museums I have worked in approach their exhibitions. I believe that viewers are, more, are often more ready to be challenged than museum staff give them credit for. It is important to not only engage our audiences within their comfort zones, but also to challenge them to exit their own comfort zones. It is often in those locations of discomfort that the most amount of learning needs and can take place. And those locations can be frightening. I found this very liberating, the email goes on, as a fairly new museum professional, looking back at the exhibit, I realized that it was liberating for the general audience as well. So I convened this panel because 20 years later it seemed like a good time to reconsider what happened then, what's happened since, and where we are now. In sequence, you will be hearing from Spencer Crew. And he'll tell you what, I, I won't tell you what they're going to talk about. They'll just talk. <laughs> and that will tell you what they're talking about. Uh, Spencer will be followed by George Sissel. Then Lisa Corin will interview Fred Wilson. And then Joanne Jones Ritzy will talk. And then Gretchen Soren. And then the part that I'm really excited to hear, to look forward to, is you to talk. <laughs> This, our part of it should hopefully run about 40 minutes. The choreography is going to be a little clunky, but you'll just have to live with it. I mean, um, and then, as I say, we want to hear from you. So thank you for coming. I think it's going to be a great morning. Good morning. Good morning. Gosh, there are a lot of you out there. <laughs> We know it's all about Fred, so I'll try not to take too much time. <laughs> uh, I'm sort of the historian of the group in some ways, and uh, what struck me as I was asked to talk about this was trying to think back 20 years ago, my mind's still working sort of back that far, about what it was like to go see this exhibition in Baltimore in 1992. And what struck me were a number of things. I think we were all struck by the ideas that Fred put forth, the way he used the objects, the way he provoked the thought of the individuals who came to see an exhibition. But what also struck me is that he also was having a conversation to the field. It was a conversation about an interesting concept we were struggling over, the concept of provenance. What does provenance mean? How do you apply it? Where is it appropriate? How much does it rule the kind of things that we choose to do and how we do those different kinds of things? And it was an important conversation at the time because provenance became the guardian over what kind of exhibitions that one could do within their, their, within their institution. For years and years and years, the argument had been that the provenance had to be exactly right for the object that you use in order to use it in your exhibition. If you did not have the right object, you could not do the exhibition. 
objects were the core of what we did. Well, this is an interesting point of view to offer because traditional collections weren't very varied, very diversified in terms of whom they collected them from, who was represented, what stories could be told. And what happened was that this became sort of a very convenient way for the field, for museums, especially mainstream museums, to not do exhibitions, to not do programs that spoke to a wide variety of individuals. Frey specifically talked about African Americans and American Indians in his exhibition, which was important because those collections weren't directed towards the, those, those individuals, but he began to bring the stories forward. So that as we began to think about provenance and an issue, he was attacking, I think, this idea that provenance rules all. And also attacking the fact that our institutions were not doing the exhibitions because they didn't have the collections to do it. And having working in the field at the time, it was a real struggle to work through because it allowed these institutions not to do exhibitions and do programs about the brown and black people who lived around them and were becoming more and more of their, um, of, of their, uh, of their audiences. Now, Fred's voice was a crescendo on a number of other people who had been pushing this idea for a long time. If you look back to the 1950s, the African American Museums movement really emerged out of this argument about institutions not being willing to tell diverse stories. Museums were saying that we don't have those objects, they probably don't exist, they're too hard to find, why should we go down this path? Well, the founders of the African American Museum movement are arguing just the opposite. That in fact, these objects exist. They are in the homes, in the uh, basements, in the attics of different places. What you need to do is you need to go find them. You need to go talk to those individuals. You need to let them know that you consider what they have is important. So what emerges out of this is that you do have a series of African American museums that begin to come to the forefront in the 1950s. The most important of them is the, uh, is the DuSable Museum in Chicago, and now the Charles Wright African American Museum in Detroit. These two individuals, Margaret Burroughs and Charles Wright, were founders in terms of speaking out about the need to collect more broadly, to value the holdings in other communities, and to show that, in fact, these things did indeed exist. Their protests, I think, were a thorn in the side of the, of the uh, of museums and were forcing them to begin to think in different kinds of ways. Their voices, very strident, very loud, I think, were supported by an interesting activity that happened at an AAM meeting in 1971. At that time, there were a group of artists who took over the meeting and essentially disrupted everything that was going on to the horror of the very dignified people in the museum. And what they were saying was that you, you represent and focus your attention on the wrong things, that you are bourgeois institutions that weren't concerned with the lives and the presentations and the ideas of everyday people. We were just looking at the rich and the famous, and we needed to change that. And I think this disruption in 1971, <coughs> along with this, this growing uh, voices in the African American community and communities, suggesting that in fact museums needed to change in direction, were very important in terms of changing and beginning to shift the argument within the museum field about how do we think about programs? How do we think about collecting? Are those things out there? And I think these protests do begin to provoke some changes in the thinking and the conversations taking place in these larger mainstream museums. One way that it changes it is that the people that they hire begin to look a little bit different. They have color of change. As a consequence, they bring with them other points of view, other perspectives, other arguments about how museums should think about themselves and who should be represented within them in terms of their collections and their exhibitions. What parallels this is there's beginning to be efforts within museums to try to create connections to these broader communities to have collecting uh, policies, to have collecting activities that are trying to get these kind of objects with the right provenance to be used in the exhibitions that they're doing. The difficulty with this was that they didn't have often connections or relationships with these broader communities. So that they had to uh, launch special initiatives in order to make this happen. This became sometimes an expensive thing to do and a difficult thing to do because they didn't have those relationships and those relationships had to be built over time. So it meant that still this process of building collections was taking a long time and the number of exhibitions and number of presentations that were coming forward were still very, very slow 
and it's still very tradition bound around the idea of biological uh, pronouns. <clears throat> what had to change, and where the discussion needed to shift, was how important was provenance to the creation of exhibitions? Did you have to have the book held by Frederick Douglass in order to tell Frederick Douglass' story? Did you have to have Martin Luther King's Bible in order to talk about Martin Luther King? And the question was, how do we shift that? And you began to have the conversations, I think, that looked at this and began to push the idea that maybe Provenance did not have to be exact in these conversations, but it needed to be near so. And there began to be exhibitions that began to look at this question and began to push whether or not we could change and shift the nature of the conversation. Field of Factory at the National Museum of American History was one of the exhibitions that tried to do this. The task there was to tell the story of people who were migrating to the north in the 1920s when, they, when those objects were not as available as one would like. So the decision was made was that provenance was useful, provenance was not critical, that the story was much more important and that you could find objects and things that were of the kind that were used that were similar to the kind of things that were used from that period, that that would be a good representation to allow the story to move forward. Well, this was seen as a little bit strange in the, in the uh, academy at that time. In fact, there were a number of very biting criticisms directed towards that exhibition because of the decision to take this path and not using exact, precise provenance to undergird the presentation. In fact, many said that, that this was indeed a blasphemy, that uh, it undercut the value and the usefulness of the exhibition because you were not just using things that belonged to those individuals. But what it also did was begin to shift, I think, and push this conversation even further. And that brings us to Miami Museum. Because what Fred does, or did, in his exhibition was to push even further this conversation about provenance. In fact, one could say he exploded that whole conversation. Because what he was doing was making the point that provenance is in the eye of the whole. That as you think about provenance, the question is, what is the part of the history of that object, of that thing, that gives it authority, that gives it value, that situates it in, in life? Is it the, uh, the person that it belongs to? Is it the person who serves with it? Is it the, the person who cleans it at night? Whose connection is more important in these stories? Also, do they have to have a direct connection, or can they be a platform for larger conversations about important <coughs> kinds of issues and thoughts? And I think what happened in Miami Museum is that that whole concept of provenance as critical to telling important stories was set, pushed aside. And in fact, what Fred was saying, what he did in this was to say that, first of all, look in your collections. There are stories there that you can use if you look closely enough, if you have a creative mind if you are willing to look broadly as to how these things can be thought about. In addition, what you're saying is that even if the provenance is not direct, there were stories about their place in the culture. There are stories about the culture which they are part that can give us a larger insight into the, the uh, society in which they are part. So what you begin to find in my museum are stories connected to objects that you might not have thought about before. Stories connected to objects that give you an insight into the society of which they are a part and force you to think about larger representations. Who's affected by this? Whose lives are changed? Who are the people who are part of it but are behind the shadows and cannot be seen? So for me, while the beauty of the exhibition and the ideas were critical to its importance, what came to the surface for me was the whole issue of programs. And the fact that what happened here was that after a long series of conversations about this, that now it was exploded. I can't say it was tossed aside. I can't say it was still important. But it was, what we were saying is that provenance no longer was the commanding issue in making decisions about doing exhibitions. And by saying that, we were also saying that now we can tell other stories, even when our collections did not precisely connect to the stories that we wanted to tell. <coughs> 
And I think that was an important change that took place in how we began to think about uh, exhibitions and our presentations. It allowed us to ask important questions about important issues in society. And also to allow our institutions to think about how they make connections to parts of the uh, population that they might not have been able to make connections to before. How they became partners in their communities and diversified their presentations. Now in today's world, that is much less of an issue, much less of a struggle, although I think we have not perfected that yet. We still have a long way to go. But when my museum came to the forefront, I think it began to push us in directions that we hadn't been able to embrace before in the ways we wanted to. And so this is one of the ways that my museum is an important milestone, I think, in the development and the direction in the intellectual growth of our field is going to that point on. Good morning. Good morning. I was asked to tell the backstory of my museum. Um, as the founding director of the Contemporary, which was the institution that I conceived of the project and invited Fred to Baltimore, it was felt that really to look back at how all this began. And to do that, as I say to my grad students in curatorial practice at LICA, and to many of the young people here, you have to historically think about, as Spencer said, what was going on in the field. Because in 1989, 1990, which is when the contemporary was founded, the museum world certainly did not look like it does today. Nor were there discussions about issues of audience, or community, or engagement. Museums were very much a closed, members-only society for people of certain income, or class, or education. It certainly was at the, the peak of the culture wars, 1989 and 1990, when the museums obviously had to start thinking about their audience and who they were trying to reach. It's very interesting to think back in AAM in 1990, when Lisa Corn and I attended the conference in Chicago, when unlike today, there was never a session that talked about audience, artists working in museums, engaging communities out, outside of membership. It was very much an internal discussion, unlike today. The Contemporary was founded on the principle, really, of connecting art and artists to a wider audience. Our really mission was to expand and redefine exhibition, collection, and education practices. We became in 1989 a nomadic museum. We were called the Unmuseum by the New York Times, the Hermit Crab Museum. <laughs> we took our ectoskeleton and took to different communities working with artists. We took them into unlikely, temporary, non-contemporary art spaces. We created collaborations that cross disciplines including the healthcare community, the Russian ref refugee community, and victims of gun violence in Baltimore. After doing these projects for, the, for our first two years, roaming around the city, working with different artists and communities, and we started to evaluate what we were doing, and saw that there was an impact. But the impact certainly was in communities and what artists were doing. But no one was really getting what our mission was about questioning museum practice. So we took a step back and we thought about what if we chose a project or an artist whose very practice was questioning museological issues. The timing couldn't have been better. Lisa and I attended a lecture by Fred Wilson. We knew Fred's work up from the Bronx and projects he had done at Metro Gallery um, and working with faux objects and creating environments uh, uh, that look like museums. So we invited him to come visit Baltimore. And in his visit in Baltimore, we took him around to many of our cultural institutions here as his research. From that research, 
Fred requested the Maryland Historical Society. Why? Because his story, when he went in there, was invisible. It was hidden away. And he wanted to see if he could perhaps reveal it to the public. Ironically, the year before, in one of our projects that we were putting on in a vacant uh, Greyhound bus terminal in the next block from the Maryland Historical Society, right behind it, we had the cause to have to go and meet the director, Charles Lyle. Why? Because we needed bathrooms for our volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> and so we sought the permission from Charles Lyle, and he wanted to know who we were and what we were doing. And we literally looked out his back window of his office to point it to the holes in the roof of the Greyhound bus terminal where our project was going to be and explained to him what our mission was and what we were trying to do. As we were leaving, he said to Lisa and I as we were in the lobby as we passed these 18th century high, high boys, I really am envious of what you're doing. I wish I could figure out a way to connect these to the children that live in the projects three blocks from here. A year later, Lisa and I took up that challenge. And of course, that gave us entry into the Historical Society with Fred. It was a six-month courtship um, between staffs and boards, staffs at all levels, from facilities to the guards, um, to the directors, to the curators, to the historians, the libraries, because these are all people that Fred would have to work with during his year residency there. We created a contract that, um, that literally not just talked about the relationship between the museums and their responsibilities, but most importantly, to protect Fred's right as a contemporary artist <coughs> and the creative freedoms. Again, the culture wars were still being fought. And the historic society certainly had never worked with contemporary artists before. They did not know about the issues that could come up with artists. And so all that was laid out, talked about with Fred. Fred had to agree to all that, the parameters, there were many restrictions. Um, no objects could be bought from outside of the museum, they had to be used in the collection. All the text and labels had to be proved historically accurate. You could not lie about an object, um, as he had perhaps done in <laughs> and his year-long residency was not just a start to study doing this research uh, with our interns from the contemporary, and with many of the many uh, artists throughout Maryland who also worked on the, on the project, were trained as docents uh, to, to work on the project, but also with the larger Baltimore community. We were with schools and community members to be involved in this. I, I'd like to read from you two things from the forward to the, the catalog of Marion Museum that the contemporary published with the New Press. It was very interesting to think back uh, in 1993, of course, when the AM conference was being scheduled here, and I was on the host committee for it, and of course we were planning Marion Museum strategically around the dates that it would still be up when the conference was here. But this is reflecting back 20, two years ago in the catalog. In undertaking my own museum, the contemporary wanted to illustrate how its new model for museum practices could be applied to any type of museums. This meant arguing strenuously for a new museology, one that began first with a critique of the decision-making process that governed all museums. And here is how we ended the forward to the catalog, which is very appropriate, I think, for the 2013 AM session. For museums to meet the difficult challenges we face today, we must represent and involve the communities we are a part of to accurately reflect our shared history, complex and painful though that history might be. Mining Museum has been merely a reminder that there is still much work to be done. We hope Mining Museum will inspire other museums to explore difficult issues that are part of our past and our present.